Do you remember some days ago where you sit together with your loved ones and you had to fix their computers and told them how things work and why they are working the strange way they are working? Imagine you have to do this for teaching them how to program and give them the passion and the love that you have for programming. So please, let's give Mike Sperber a great applause for his talk, How to Teach Programming to Our Loved Ones. So if, you, if you're teaching programming, that's a great ego booster, right? You know that. If your audience is, is large enough, or if you've got super gifted children, like you probably all do, then um, you, know, you can teach them just about anything, and they will, say, they will tell you, and they will give you feedback telling you how wonderful that was. So for example, uh, I like functional programming. So that's a lambda, which stands for functional programming. And um, you know, whenever I teach that to a sufficiently large audience, some, some guy, somebody typically looking like that would come up to me and tell me, oh, this, this, is, this is Lambda stuff, this functional programming stuff, that's the most wonderfulest thing I've ever heard. And you're a great teacher. Um, and so um, in the introduction, it said something about a couple of days. So I think I've been teaching for 30 years now. Um, in various contexts, to high school students, to university students, uh, to kids, to humanities majors, to computer science majors, to computer science minors, uh, in professional training, to co-workers. Um, but if I take the totality of my teaching experience, most of that overall, looking back, was a failure. And I want to talk about those failures, more about the successes that come from the passion. So if you look at initiatives that aim at fostering programming skills among children, for example, they always talk about getting people excited and sort of uh, exciting their passion for, uh, for programming. And you hear politicians talk like that a lot too. We need to get young people into technology because that is the future. I'm not sure about that personally, but it always seems to end up in classrooms that look like this that typically have a bunch of robots in there sold by some company. Um, and that are supposed to, because robots are for some reason inherently interesting, they're supposed to get kids or whomever interested in programming, excited about programming. And that's all good and well. Um, also, I think there's this underlying assumption that only if we would get people excited and interested in programming, they would sort of acquire the required skills uh, by themselves through some process of trial and error or osmosis or something like that. Um, and I think the most prominent project that propagated that notion, some of you may remember, was this One Laptop Per Child initiative uh, a couple of years ago. And you don't, I haven't seen many of those at this conference. Um, and the reason for that is that the educational concepts around uh, One laptop, laptop Per Child were based on this idea of, I think, what's called constructivism. This idea that only if you give children enough material and access to uh, whatever, the internet and, and teaching materials, then they will all figure it all, all themselves, and they will figure out how to build programs by themselves. And I think one of the underlying uh, problems, I mean, there were many problems with OLPC, but one of the problems was certainly that just this approach to uh, didactics and pedagogy doesn't work particularly well. Um, and you find variations of that every, pretty much every year there's an educational initiative uh, built on this notion of inspiring, uh, you know, passion for programming. You know, last year you could hear about um, a project called Bob, which essentially is about programming a little... Um, a little robot-like device uh, that has blinking lights and things like that, and it's certainly very interesting. And you program it by, um, I think you can see that here, you program it by uh, essentially downloading um, uh, already, uh, somebody's already programmed some C++ code for you, and you take some line in the middle and change it to change the blinking frequency or something like that. And again, all that is good and well, and I don't want to denigrate that, but um, it's all good and well for inspiring passion. But all of these projects, all these projects have in common is that they are not really about teaching the methodology of programming. And so this is, you know, this is what this talk is about, and it's probably going to be the most boring talk you've ever heard. Um, if you want, um, if you want to inspire passion for programming and for for computers, uh, there's lots of projects right outside this door, specifically today on the Young Hacker Talk, uh, that will tell you how to do that. The problem is that if you want to transition from these projects to actually serious, substantial programming projects that your learners uh, want to undertake uh, by themselves, 
And if you look closely enough, you will find that a lot of people get frustrated um, by that experience of, of writing more complex programs. And even if they do not get frustrated, their code often ends up looking like that on the right-hand side. And um, so, so, of course, this entire conference is in the spirit of tinkering and building things by trial and error, and you see a lot of things that look like this. But, um, you know, in the upcoming IoT apocalypse, maybe uh, we want to have a little bit slightly more methodical approach. So, um, the problem is really that most didactic approaches to programming do not work very well. And I, for the longest time, I really didn't have a good explanation as to why that was and why maybe the stuff that I was doing or that I learned how to do over the years uh, worked better. And so finally, I found a, found a great book uh, that, that confirms uh, some of my biases uh, that I read to just the day before yesterday as I was preparing this talk. Um, and it has a couple of cognates, so written by a cognitive scientist, Daniel Willingham. Um, and um, he lists a couple of principles that uh, are active when students learn, right? And I think one of the things that's really important is that we all have this idealistic notion that everybody loves to learn, right? But in fact, learning is quite a difficult activity and it's quite straining. And um, so even though people are curious about things and they love to look at things and they like to have successful learning experiences, if that learning experience means they have to think hard, then at least some people shun um, those same experiences. Another problem is, um, um, so and that's, that's of course a problem when you transition from a primitive programming environment like Scratch or Bob or something to more complicated things that uh, you can easily get frustrated and then shun away from the learning uh, experiences that are required to take the next step. Um, another one that I found interesting is, so these are just all the cognitive principles in that book, so it's going to be very, very textual and boring, but I liked it so much. Um, so it says factual knowledge precedes skill, but if you think, so what it means is really that you need to have um, that, that if you want to learn a particular skill, you need to associate that with factual knowledge. But if you think about the factual knowledge that is associated with programming, then a lot of the principles underlying our everyday programming skills are usually unnamed, and they're not really put in specific words. And so they're not in the form of uh, factual knowledge, and which is why a lot of people have trouble with the skill part. Um, I love this bit, which says, memory is the, the residue of thought, which is that we don't always remember the things that we should be remembering, but that we remember things that we spend a lot of thought on. And that means, in particular, for educational initiatives that are centered around robots or something that's really, um, that is supposed to take over the passion part of programming, but not really central to the activity of programming, people tend to think about the robots. They tend to think about the motors and actuators and things like that, and those are worthy skills in and of themselves, but they don't contribute much to the actual skill of programming. I remember asking a proponent of such an educational uh, initiative a number of years back, you know, what is, it, what is the skill that students take away from your, from your robot class? And he said, well, after that class, where they spend all their free time for a semester or a year, they really know what pi is. And um, I don't know, for me, that is not enough. Um, so, uh, another thing is that uh, maybe that doesn't go so much towards um, computer science or programming experience, but, um, uh, but also to the way that we do math education, is we understand new things in the context of things we already know, and in particular, we find it easier to under understand concrete things. And I think both in, um, both in math and computer science, a lot of explanations are in the form of explaining some abstract thing rather than showing how to do a concrete thing. And so we'll get back, so this is going to be a major point later on. Um, something that didn't really need saying in that book, proficiency requires practice. So if you want to get better at programming, you need to practice it with the goal of getting better at it. So in the classroom or in a teaching environment, you really need to create situations that foster successful practice, the successful solution of problems. So that, um, you know, this natural curious part in the beginning, so, so, student, so people generally derive a dopamine rush uh, from successfully um, solving problems. So we really need to put um, we really need to put our students in a situation where they can successfully solve problems uh, that are not too hard and also not too easy, because if they're too easy, the dopamine rush will not be big enough. Um, here's a trap I think that most, every, most people who teach programming know about, is that cognition is different early and late in training. And if you're here, most people in this room are late in training, so we've been in touch with computers for a long time. 
So our cognitive processes, when we think about programming, are different than the cognitive processes of beginning students. Sometimes that's also called the curse of knowledge. So just because we find some piece of material inspiring or interesting, or some technique of explaining something very persuasive, that does not mean that our students find it similarly persuasive and find it similarly easy to follow along our teaching. Um, if you're teaching big classrooms, uh, I think there's been a, been a big push towards individualistic learning. Um, and um, of course, that's wonderful. On the other hand, uh, children tend to be quite alike in their style of learning. And so um, I'm not going to be talking about that, much to, that very much today, but there's still great value in having a classroom with several students that are all being taught the same thing. Um, not a subject today, but um, I could also that, that also has been confirmed by experience. Uh, generally, some people think that you know, some, some people are good at math and some people are bad at math. You know, girls are always bad at math for some reason. Um, and it turns out that this is, well, first of all, it's not true. And even if you feel you're bad at something, then usually um, what, what we call intelligence uh, can be changed through sustained hard work. Um, I think you know, 10 or 20 years ago, a lot of people believed in IQ, that in an innate ability to learn things. Um, but it turns out that, that most of the effects of IQ on your ability to do things well are quite indirect and through the environment rather than through some structure in your brain that you were born with. Um, and so that's something that you really learn when you do 30 years of teaching, is really that your teaching can improve over time, but in order to improve, you really must get feedback and you must practice it and get feedback the same way that the skill itself uh, must be practiced. And that sometimes gets you feedback that is, um, well, surprising sometimes, and also it's often quite, um, quite painful because sometimes you get the feedback that your teaching just did not work. So really, um, I want to aim a programming education at a diverse audience and not just, I mean, if you look at the robot class, if your student population that ends up being in that robot class is really as diverse as, you like it, as you'd like it to be, I think often that is not the case. So the stuff that I'm going to be talk about, that I'm going to talk about has been applied not always by me, uh, but to children, to high school students, to university students, to professional developers, and works quite well. And what it is based on is a set of systematic methods. Um, and I'll try to show you in great and painstaking detail of what that means. Um, and um, so here are some references that you can look at. In particular, we build on the work of the PLT group in the US, um, led by Matthias Felleisen, who have a great book out, and I'll give you a reference to that later. Um, there's, a, there's a significant project um, for teaching high school students um, in the US, and there's also a project that I'm involved with, which is called, which is called Dein Programm, which tries to be sort of the little um, German sister of that stuff. So um, one aspect um, that's important to this method of teaching is that all the tools that we use are geared towards learners. In particular, that means that there is a specific programming environment that was made specifically for learners rather than your Emacs or VI or whatever your favorite thing is um, that, you wanna, I, that you wanna inflict on your learners. I, I don't think you should. I'm an Emacs person myself. Um, so um, also what it means is that we have, that we use specific programming languages that are derived from real programming languages, but that have been modified to be especially, especially suitable for learners. Um, and also then we have something called the design recipes, which are, um, uh, which are a set of methods for systematic program construction that try to provide this factual basis for the methodology of programming. And um, so this programming environment, all of this stuff, by the way, can be downloaded um, for free. And um, so there's a great system called Racket, um, developed, developed by the PLT group. But there's a tiny corner in there that I'm going to refer to today, uh, which is great for many things. But it was originally designed and still is great for teaching. So, um, so let me try to switch to that. I hope that works out. This moment always scares me. So here is the system called uh, Dr. Racket. And you can see it has, uh, it has not very many buttons. Um, it does not look like Eclipse or Visual Studio or something like that. It does not look like a professional programming environment. And the way this works, and I'm going to try to show you how it works, is um, in the upper part of that window, there's just the program. That's a text editor with a couple of special features, not very many. And down here is the repo, uh, which you can use to interact with the program that you've written. We're not going to be using that very much. But um, what you can do in the repo 
in the beginning at least, is you can just type something and it will give you, it will Im immediately tell you the result of the evaluation of what you typed in. Um, and now you have to remember, it's, this is going to be alien and strange to you, but um, the way this works is these languages are based on Lisp, so they use round parentheses a lot. And specifically, when, always when you want to put something together, they have round parentheses and they have the operator in front. And especially if you've been programming for a long time, you think, oh, no, this is, I'm never going to get used to that. But I can promise you, your children will have a very easy time dealing with this. So you could go and say, uh, you know, you could just type a number, and it will give you the result. You could type a string, you know, Mike, it will give you the result. It, you could go and... Um, uh, you, could, you, know, you could combine numbers, right, by adding them together. Um, you could... Let's go away with that. Looks like this. So that, that's what it, what it looks like. A compound expression is always parens around it and the operator in front. So you don't really say, you know, this number plus that number. You say the sum of those two numbers, okay? And um, so it gives me the result of that. What's kind of fun, if you're a C programmer or a Java programmer, this is kind of fun. And children love this for some reason, I don't know. Um, so um, what you can also do is um, the same way that you're used to having numbers and strings and whatever and booleans be values, pictures are also values. So that sometimes helps when you're trying to drum up that little piece of motivation that you need. So you could do like a rectangle that is solid blue, and that's a value. And whatever, whenever there's a value, you can write a program that um, binds that value to a name by writing define. So you could do something you know, really exciting like this. Um, you would define pi for something. We could run that program, and then we could put top pi here. But we could also do uh, you know, r, that rectangle, and whatever, 50 uh, solid red. And we can run that program, and here's that rectangle. What's maybe more interesting is that we can um, maybe do another rectangle, uh, you know, that's solid blue. And you can also see here's the same principle at work, right? Parentheses around the define. So the define says it's a definition, and the rectangle is just a call to a function that comes with Dr. Racket, and it's also in front. Um, and so I could do that, and now I have R, I have F2. And I could also do things, things like, you know, there's, for example, a function that takes two pictures and puts them beside each other. So there's a little, jumping ahead a little bit, there's a little algebra of pictures in here that you can use to program video games, for example, uh, later in the class if that's something that you want to do. So this is not entirely without motivational examples. Um, so there's that. Yeah, let's, let's see how far we can go from there. Um, Okay, so, but uh, getting away from those motivational examples. Um, in German, we're very big on traffic rules, right? Straßenverkehrsordnung. So there are many rules, right? And we'll try to model that. Uh, this is going to make this the most boring talk you've ever heard. Um, so we're going to categorize German traffic violations. Um, so in particular, there's two kinds of uh, traffic violations. There's red light violations, where it's important where they happen, and it's also important what the duration is. Uh, how long after the light has turned red uh, passes uh, before you actually cross the intersection or the, the red light. And then there's a speeding violation where you also have a place and you just have how many kilometers per hour did you go over the limit. And we want to write functions, and I'll tell you how to do that, for, e for yielding the place of a violation and classifying a violation as serious or not. And um, for that purpose, we're going to do, use something called the design recipe. Um, or rather, as there's, we're going to use several design, design recipes. And first of all, there's an overall design recipe, which says how you write a function. And please don't fall asleep. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, eight steps to this. And we always ask our students to always go through those eight steps. And you think, this is off. I mean, I hope you do, right? You feel this, is, this already looks like the most boring is, you know, exposition to programming ever. This is like the German bureaucracy approach to teaching how to program. On the other hand, um, so, so, but, you know, it works. That is the point. Specifically, each of those steps is something that is small enough so that students can usually successfully do it, and if you can reward it with credit or candy or whatever, 
um, then you know, students will be motivated to get to the next step. Um, you know, if you've ever taught unsuccessfully, and probably most of you have always taught successfully, but what always happened to me is then when my teaching would be unsuccessful, my students would be staring at a blank screen. Right? And I would give them this problem, and I felt this problem was really solvable, and they would give up before typing the first key. Right? They wouldn't know where to begin, because there's usually most approaches to teaching how to program are example-based. They give you some example. You know, here's that program solves that problem, or oh, here's a different problem, now solve that. And you already saw how that's done. And that process usually or often does not work. And so this fixed sequence of steps gets students over that hump. And I'm going to try to explain that really in painstaking detail, because the books don't really do justice to how bureaucratic and painstaking it is. Um, so you'll all have the benefit of that. So there's always these eight steps, and then there's more instructions that come with each of those steps, right? But these instructions are eminently learnable, and that's the um, important aspect here. So in particular, um, so I'm going to sort of jump in right ahead. Um, oops. Oops. Ah, you see something that I don't see. Ah, there we go. So if you look at this, um, problem statement. So uh, well, let me go back one more. So it says the first thing that you do is, well, you do a short description of a function. We already have two short descriptions of the functions. You know, find the place uh, of a traffic violation and find out if it's serious or not. And then it says, please conduct a data analysis. And data analysis means that you look at the entities in your, prob in your problem and, um, and analyze them. And here it says, well, this is all about traffic violations. And it says something of the sort that there's, for example, a red light violation. And it says that red light violation has place and duration. And that duration is in seconds. So one thing that you can do is you can look at the wording of how that data is described. And if you discover a wording that says, you know, this thing consists of these pieces, right? Or this thing has several different properties, this is a phenomenon that we call compound data. And that has a special design recipe that PowerPoint somehow threw away. Um, let's see. Ah, OK, it comes up again. So it says, well, you recognize compound data by a description of your data that uses words like consists of or has. And then you write a definition, data definition of that form, and I will show you how that works. Then something really trivial comes. You count the ingredients, and you may write a, what's called a record definition. That's actual code. And then you ensure that the counts match. And you know, these are instructions in the textbook. right? And, and students learn to memorize those instructions. Um, and you all, you're all going asleep. You, you know, you're all falling asleep, but sorry about that. Um, so let's see. Where's the right window? Here's the right window. So, that's what we were doing, right? Um, I'm going well, to leave that here for your entertainment. It says, well, a red light violation. I'm so excited. I need to talk. And we said it has this formulation. It says has. And we're just going to write it down in a slightly more systematic way. Uh, so it has a place. And it has a duration in seconds, right? And that's just a piece of natural language. And those semicolons, they make this a comment. OK? Um, so we didn't do much except writing each component of our compound data in a separate line. And then it said, I can't really display it at the same time. Then it said, write a record definition. And the record definition has this form. It's really, uh, it looks a little tedious, but it's actually quite valuable. Um, so it says, we're talking about red light violation. So we give our thing a name. So that's called red light violation. Uh, red light violation. Then we will need to create red light violation objects. Um, so we will need a constructor. So I'm going to write down the name of that constructor. Eventually, we will need to distinguish red light violations from other things. So I'm going to write something that's a predicate that we'll use a little later. And then we have two parts. And I can't emphasize enough how important it is that you sort of remember two. Right? It has two parts because it says that there's a place and a duration in seconds. And we write the names of things that will extract um, those pieces. So we go here, it says red light violation place and red light violation uh, duration. Or we could, well, let's, let's call it second so we always know what that is. And now what that does is, 
when I run it, is, well, it doesn't do anything. But what we can do is um, we can now create objects that represent red light violations. And so what we could do is, well, let me first show you how it's done. We do make red light violation. You know, there's one in Bork. Uh, somebody, you know, had a red light violation for four seconds in Borg, right? And it, then it will display a record value um, that shows what the parts are that we had. And so I can copy this um, up here and call it and make an example out of that. Uh, and so like this. And so now we have RV1 here. So this is what's called a constructor. And this constructor... Um, when we call it, creates this object, and this object really creates uh, data that is associated with information. So that's an important aspect to explain. And so usually we ask students, and I can't, I'm not writing this down to explain it to you. I'm writing it down to show to you what to expect from students. And so you go, ah, oh, make them do it. Um, so this is a red light violation. In Borg, uh, you know, four seconds, you know, four seconds. So it, it seems really trivial to you, um, but it's important to really um, to link the program to the problem domain that we're in, right? Uh, uh, so we have a minor red light violation here. Am I spelling this right? Uh, anyway, so here we go. Um, and one way to talk about this new function that we created, meg red light violation, is uh, writing down something that we call a signature. And it looks sort of like a type, type signature, but isn't quite. Um, that's something that we did specifically for teaching. So you do meg red light violation. And remember, in math, you would sometimes write f, uh, f colon um, to denote a type, and here we just put the colon in front, so it says make red light violation. Well, it takes a string that says what the place is, it takes some rational number that says how long it went, how long the red light violation um, was over the limit, and it creates a red light violation object. Um, so that's not going to do much. Um, unless, um, well, let me, let me show you something. If I wrote something else here, I wrote a number here. Um, something, uh, where'd it go? Um, so, it's, uh, so it says, it gives an error message here, and it's, I think it's due to full screen mode for some reason. Uh, let me see if we can do this again. No, not quite. Uh, ah, okay, now we know what it is. So, um, yeah, it was. So, when you, unfortunately, this is in German, so I hope some of you read German. I'll try to translate. It says, well, this program still has to be tested, but it says there was a, so it says here, Signaturverletzung, which means signature violation, and it says I got five in this, in this line here, um, and really, so this is the five, oops, right here in this line, and it violated the signature here. So it gives you, so the system, that's one aspect of what makes the system specifically designed for learners, is that it gives you very specific feedback um, as you run the program. Okay, so um, let's do away with this. Let's get this down here. So now, um, one of the challenges or one of the problems in a problem statement was to write a function that determines whether a red light violation is serious or not. And so when we do that, it said, well, you put a short description in front. Um, and so here's a short description. And there are lots of religious wars about how many comments you should put in a program. But to our learners, we say, put one line, not more, not less, in front of every function. Um, and that's usually about the right level. So um, is a red light violation, serious. So the next thing is, um, well, if you remember that slide, it says, well, if you're writing a function, if you're implementing a piece of functionality that always ends up being a function in functional programming, you write a signature for that function that talks about what goes in and out of that function. So in this case, uh, we, well, we have to make up a name for that. So 
it practically writes itself here. Um, and uh, so we just put, so in this language, you can put a question mark in the middle of a name, and you can also put hyphens in the middle of a name. And what we want is we want a red light violation to go in, and we want a Boolean to come out that says whether that violation was serious or not. So those are already steps in that design recipe that you saw. And so if you're in a classroom situation or whatever, you can give credit for each immediate step, and you should, uh, because those are, already, those are all small successes um, in, um, in your programming endeavor. So the next thing that you should do is you should write examples or tests. Those are almost the same thing here. And um, so fortunately, we already have examples of red light violations, so we just have to write down how we expect our function to behave with respect to those examples. So um, there's something called check expect, and I hope you recognize that principle that, we're, um, uh, that things are always named in the front. So we could say red light violation serious. With children, you might want to pick shorter names if they can't type that fast yet, but with grown-ups, this this works. Um, so the first one is four, four seconds over, so that's pretty serious. So we expect that to be true, and that hash mark T means true. Um, and so, and you, and the other one is half a second over, and that's not so serious under German law. That's fine. Okay, so. The next step, so now we've written, so let me, let me label those things, right? This is the short description. This is the signature. Uh, uh, these are the tests. And now you write something called the skeleton. And the skeleton is just, you start writing the function, but you already have some information about that function. You know the name of that function, and you know how many things come in and out. In and out. So you write, uh, oops, typo here. Um, So, and, well, this is a functional language, so somebody always has to write lambda somewhere. So when we make a function in these languages, we always write lambda. So we want to make a function that accepts one thing, and that is a red light violation. A red light, we'll just call it RLV. And, and we'll just put three dots here. So the three dots, I don't mean to say we're going to fill in the rest later. It means in class, when I do this, I actually type three dots. And in class, especially at the beginning, we actually ask our students to type the three dots, because this is the skeleton. This already gives you credit. Um, and it's, it's, you know, since this is so easy to do, it really means that there's, um, uh, you, you're not staring at a white piece of paper, and maybe you feel encouraged to do that next step. Now, the next step says you have to fill in what's called a template, and those are elements of the function that you're writing that derive from the data that goes in, and sometimes from the data that goes out. In this case, the data that goes in is one of those red light violation objects, and that red light violation object, if you remember, may remember, is a compound object. It has two pieces. And whenever you write a function that accepts compound data with two pieces, you probably need to look at those pieces. So what you do is you write, um, uh, you have to write something that will tell you um, what those pieces are. And remember, so I haven't actually told you how that works, but um, remember, here was the record definition up here, and it told us, and we have a signature there that tells us how to construct a red light violation object, and so what we also need is we need a way to get the components out of a red light violation object, so we need what's called selectors or accessors, and those are the things in parentheses here and here, and you can also describe them with signatures, and strangely enough, uh, so and here, a red light violation thing goes in, and a string comes out. And uh, and in this case, a red light violation goes in, and a uh, what did we say? A rational comes out. So those are, of course, those signature declarations. They are redundant. You don't have to put them in. They're redundant with a constructor declaration. And you're going to sleep. You're going to sleep any more, even more probably than you were. But I had an epiphany in class where I would only write the constructor signature, and the students would ask me to also write the, um, the accessor signatures. Um, and so they made me even more bureaucratic than I, was already, uh, by the, I, than I already was by nature. So now here, what we do is we want to get access to the different parts, so we write red light violation 
place of RLV, so that's one piece, violation uh, seconds of RLV, that's the second part. And those are building blocks, so really, if you're really strict about it, you might have people type, you know, three dots in here also. Um, so these just say these are building blocks for your function. And so you think about how those parts contribute to the answer to your question. So the question was, is the red light violation serious or not? And then you can think about, well, is the place relevant, whether it was serious or not? And in Germany, I think it's not. Uh, but it is relevant how many seconds you went over. So um, you then, have to, then you go through this conscious act of you have, you've written it down, but now you delete it again because you've done a little bit of thinking. Um, and you go and, well, then you look up, I look this up on the internet, if it's over one second, then, or if it's one second or over, then it's serious, and then you delete all the ellipses um, and make sure all the parentheses close, and then you run the program. Um, and, ah, here's still the signature violation that we need to fix. Um, So, and we can. So it says here again. There's a little German sentence. This be, sentence because these languages were designed for Germans. Uh, so both tests were successful because we wrote two test cases here. Okay. So and this bureaucratic approach just goes on and on. So I'm just going to go through the second iteration more quickly. Um, so it said, um, you know, what did it say? It said, um, it said this. We also have a speeding violation. So let's go through the motions of that. A speeding violation has, uh, again, it also has a place, and it has, you know, how many kilometers per hour over. And we write a record definition. Um, Uh, something like this, and we could do, you know, two speeding vials. So, so now we have um, a data definition that says, oh, we've got two components. We've got a record definition that needs to match that. Um, you all think this is trivial, but with compound data, students often have trouble. So it serves well, to, serves you well to remind them that there's two pieces, and those two pieces need to be selectors in the record definition. So we have speeding violation one, speeding violation, you know, out on Main Street, you know, what, 20 kilometers over, and we have another one, uh, you know, Low Street or whatever, that is 25 kilometers over. So here's two examples, right? Um, and we have one on Low Street. 25 kilometers per hour over limit. Um, so once again, the speeding violation constructor has a little uh, signature that says, well, natural number goes in, speeding violation object comes out. And um, so we go through those same notions. I need two things in order to demonstrate one more thing. So then again, the question was, when is a, spe when is a speeding violation serious? Is a speeding violation serious? Mm -hmm. And of course, the speeding violation goes in, and a Boolean comes out. Um, and so we will write two tests. So speeding violation in Germany is serious when it's 21 kilometers an hour over the limit or over that, right? And it gets progressively more serious after that. So, um, so the first one is not too serious, will not get you any points in Flensburg. Um, but the second one is. So, and once again, we go write speeding violation series. We write the skeleton. Um, so, then we write the skeleton, then we fill in the gaps, and it says we really should be writing uh, uh, calls to the accessors. 
Uh, so we have the place of the speeding violation, and we have the um, uh, kilometers over of the speeding violations. And then we think a little bit, and then we realize, oh, the place does not matter. So I'm skipping, of course, this all goes on usually over the, a longer period of time that you're teaching, so I'm going, uh, I'm going pretty fast here. So we do away with that, and we go, well, this really, if this is over 21, then that's bad. Um, okay, so let's see if that works. It says kilometer hour over. So and then it says oh, all four uh, tests are passed. So that's good. Um, so you know, there's primitive data, there's compound data. You may have noticed that on the slide it said a traffic violation is either a red light violation or a speeding violation. So that's not compound data. When you see this formulation. Um, in your language that says it's this or that or that or that or maybe it is one of the following then you're not looking at compound data you're looking at a phenomenon called mixed data um, so you've seen this you've seen this you've seen this mixed data so you recognize it um, by either the words or or one off and you write a definition data definition that really has that form you count the alternatives just like you do with compound data you write a signature definition I'll show you how to do that and you ensure that the counts match and so um, the way that you do that is this we said data definition so we said a traffic violation is one of the following um, it's either a red light violation And, or it is a speeding violation. And just as with the compound data, this little data definition has some code that goes with it, so we'll just call this thing a traffic violation, and we just use define to say what that is. And define traffic violation is a, just a signature that says it's mixed, it's mixed data from um, red light violation and speeding violation. So here you go. Um, so now we can use that in signatures. And you remember um, the problem statement didn't say find out whether a red light violation was serious or a speeding violation was serious. It said find out whether a traffic violation is serious. So, um, you know, is a traffic violation. But so far we only have functions. One works on red light violations. The other one works on speeding violations, but they don't work on that mixed. Um, so... We'll try to do that now, and instead of writing red light violation, we'll just write traffic violation, do a boolean, and um, I'll s so. And we could now write tests that match those that are there, but I'll spare you that. But in class, we absolutely would need to do that. Um, and now, what we do is, when we have a traffic violation, remember how I said. If you have compound data, you put calls to the accessors in the body, and then you go on from there. But now we're looking at mixed data in the input. So mixed data has a different template. And that template says, well, if you're looking at mixed data, it may be this or that or that. You should probably find out what that is uh, before you do anything else. And for doing that, we use a conditional. Uh, we use something like this. So what we need to do is we need to um, distinguish red light violations from speeding violations. So we need some function that will tell us which one it is. And this is the last bit up here in the record definition. You remember that we set red violation here, red light violation here. This is the name of the constructor. So this is the constructor. These are the accessors. And this is what's called the predicate. And the predicate tells us whether a thing is a red light violation or not. So in this case, the predicate says red light violation question mark or ba or p is what the programmers in these languages say um, and it takes anything and it tells us whether it is a red light violation um, object or not i'm just going to copy that down so that we remember well almost done um, so and of course the same thing goes for speeding violation so we need a conditional that has as many branches as we have alternatives in the data definition. And again, you think this is super trivial and childish, but it works very well for making successful programmers. So we need two branches, and the way that works is this. So you write this out with 
ellipses. Um, and then you need to come up with tests for the two branches. And this, in this case, the tests are, is something a red light violation or is it a speeding violation? So we have this question mark TV. And we have this, which says speeding violation TV. And so the good, and now here we just need to put in the answers. And the great thing is we already have the answers. We already have two functions that tell us whether a red light violation is serious. And uh, so we can just call that here. And uh, we can do this here. So, and then we're done. So I think that's all we can do in this hour that we have today. So I hope you see two things. First of all, this is super boring um, and super bureaucratic. Um, but maybe you can see that every single step that we have here has, is a principle that has a specific name and that you can explain in very specific, concrete terms that are not abstract. And that means it can really explain every step that's needed to solve this problem. Um, and I can't tell you what a game changer that is for teaching. If you really ask yourself if, you know, when you, when you present an example to your students, whether you can really explain every single step and explain to the students, here's what you should have thought, you know, here's how you should have picked what to do next, um, that usually ends up badly. Um, so, so one of the principles behind this uh, style of teaching is really to be absolutely sure every single step that you expect your students to make when they solve a problem has a name and has been explicitly taught in your class. So every technique has a name. You will notice me saying compound data and mixed data and design recipe and template and skeleton. Um, and so this is the factual knowledge that we use that precedes the skill that we want to uh, then um, induce. Um, if you're teaching a class that has rewards, you reward every single step. You really insist on form. Um, I also can't stress this enough. So on our homepage, you find a paper that says form over function. We don't accept any program that is correct. We just accept the ones that match the form that you've seen. Um, we also measure success. Um, you, know, you really need to look at how well your teaching style is doing, and you improve it continuously. So those are the important principles. You might think that this stifles creativity. Um, and I really don't think that's true, and I think that is based on a misguided notion of creativity. So if you talk at successfully creative artists, they really also rely on a set of name techniques that they use to tackle a creative problem. And so somebody always says Mozart, you know, Mozart never had to learn or practice uh, before he got to be a great composer, but Mozart started so early in childhood that he had his 10,000 hours of, of practice in there before most people even start. So this works for uh, so this has been proven to work, this approach for children. I think I would start about 11 years. Um, beginning programmers, it's worked for programmers that had learned some other, via some other approach, you know, bad habits uh, and professional developers. Uh, there's two websites that you can go on to get more information. One is our American ch um, sister project called Program by Design that has lots of material, links and publications, the Dr. Racket software that I showed you, and there's also a book in English, How to Design Programs. And it doesn't say that here, but that book is available for free online, but there's also a print version. And similarly, if you're looking for German language material, there's um, deinprogramm.de, which also has links in publication, links to the same software. Um, and the, the draft version of that book is there too. And hopefully, we'll have a print version of that also next year. And that's all I have for you today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike, for that talk. If you have any questions, we do have the microphones lined up here in this row and in that row. And does the signal, yes, the signal angel has a question. Yes, so one IRC user asks, what are the benefits of using this Dr. Racket tool uh, instead of, for example, Python, which was also developed for teaching? So Python is definitely not developed for teaching, um, not in any meaningful way. Um, so in practice, um, in practice, I think the fundamental difference, so, but there's a lot of educational um, initiatives around Python. The thing is really that if you try to name and, and really formalize the techniques, the systematic techniques that I showed you and apply that to Python programming, 
you will find that very hard. I personally found it impossible. Most Python programs out there in practice are just not developed systematically, and I don't know how to do that. And so that is where that is much better. This corresponds, these programming languages were, um, were designed in lockstep with the didactic principles that underlie them. And as far as I can tell, I'm sorry about that, uh, Python was not developed with any didactic principles in mind whatsoever. Sorry. OK, then microphone two. Please go now. I, I uh, teach roughly 14 years old in mm -hmm. middle school and yeah. also programming. And yeah. I use the App Inventor right now, the App okay. Inventor, MIT okay. Media Lab App Inventor. I yeah. started out with Scratch. And I, I'm not sure. You, you said, OK, you need to buy uh, Lego Mindstorm robots and stuff like that. For Scratch or MIT App Inventor, that's not the case. No, and, no. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. What I find difficult for students I have, mm -hmm. they're, they are not the best from the best parents, that they would like to show something in the yeah. end. And it's, your program looks a lot like Super Pascal. It, it's really very boring. And yeah. how, <laughs> how, how, how to bring over that point? Like, yeah. I find it Good so point. valuable. That, okay, so, in the end, they can show it on their smartphone. Yeah, depending on your target audience, of course, you choose different examples. And that, that, this example just had a lot of things. You might have seen me sh uh, show the pictures, at the, uh, show the picture algebra at the beginning. So that's something that tends to work great for children and older children alike. And that scales all the way to writing video games. And there's an entire book uh, that shows children or young people on how to do that. Um, so that's one of the great aspects of this. I think that's a fundamental difference to things like Scratch and so on. This approach to programming scales all the way to, progr to professional programming, and it scales to substantial video games. So, so the students that we, so we always used to do that, the halfway point in the first semester at the university, and they were able to write a complete like 80s style, you know, Frogger or Snakes or something like that that looked pretty fancy. And that's something I think that your children could take home. Okay, then microphone one. Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. Um, I'd like to know, so your approach uh, adds a lot of, um, let's say, overhead that is also <laughs> necessary to be taught. Um, yeah. How do you go about uh, the methodology in the actual classroom, though? Yeah, uh, are there, do, you also, do you also have some recommendations on how to tackle the actual um, design of the of the class? What methods do you use? Do you use a flipped classroom, or what do you do? Uh, yeah, good point. So, so mostly the classes that I have taught, they are taught just like what I did just now. So I try to demonstrate that to really make that clear, because it hasn't really been documented. Um, I, I could refer you to friends of mine who've taught a flipped version of that, which also seems to work quite well. Um, but the important thing, really, I can't stress this enough, that as a teacher, and I've skipped a couple of corners just now to fit in the time slot, was that you go through all of those motions, that you always go through all of that motion. And that's a great tool, not just for giving every single step a name, but also for pacing the classroom. And, that, and the rest kind of tends to fall in place, has been my experience, right? And no matter whether you're looking at you know, beginning students or professional programmers. I'm not sure I answered your questions, but um, maybe you can take the rest offline. Thank you. Microphone three, please. Uh, yes. Uh, I think this is very great, uh, but it is teaching functional programming, <laughs> and many people will very soon need imperative programming. Uh, how do you do the switch, or can you do it? So I, I would dispute that, but... Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if you so, want to get paid uh, for so it. Yeah, 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 thank you. Go, go. <laughs> So I run a company that does all their software projects doing functional programming. Um, ultimately, you will need to talk about effects. The thing what this does really is, I mean, if you're writing software professionally, you know, no matter what the language is, large parts of that should be functional. So this is a great way to teach good programming discipline. And a lot of programs out there don't show good programming discipline, so I think this would be great to improve upon that. Um, so what this does is it pushes the boundary. I, to be honest, I have no idea how to teach systematic development using imperative languages. I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to do it, and I don't know how to teach doing it. On the other hand, what I can do, that, do here is I can push the imperative parts of the programming to the fringe and make them less important for the success of my project and for the structure of my project. So, um, 
So, yeah, so it, you should, it, it, this is a good thing because we know functional programming works well. We know it is a good foundation for uh, an educational discipline. And um, yeah, I can't, I mean, there are, there are various courses that build up upon this, but um, ask me offline about that, that uh, tackle imperative programming. Okay, the microphone four, please. Yeah, I'd like to thank you for your talk too. And um, I'm curious, what's your experience? How many um, repetitions do you need to teach your students until they um, are yeah, settled with the principles? Do you teach like three examples or is it up to ten examples? I'm not sure I have a solid rule for that. Um, so my experience has been... So I think every principal here usually has like two in-class um, examples at the university level and then has maybe three or four examples where they do exercises and that's usually enough. Um, but your experience might vary. I don't, I don't think I have a good rule for that. Um, generally, you might not have gotten for this, but so the, the point of comparison and where I have the most experience is at the university level. Overall, the progression of material in here is really, really fast compared to your traditional Java course. So you can cover a lot of material using that. Um, I'm not sure how many how many you know, university students or university courses have successful video games in the middle of the first semester uh, and that are nice programs that are well structured. Um, so, so surprisingly maybe, even though this is so boring and tedious, it allows you to write programs successfully quite fast and, and also goes, allows the teaching to go quite fast. Okay, microphone two, please. Hello, thank you for your talk. Uh, when I uh, learned programming as a kid quite young and I think uh, that I could uh, transport the tools and uh, the mindset uh, also to mathematics and, and yes. problem, yeah. uh, problem solving. So I just wanted to ask if in your experience can children um, also use the systematic way of solving, I mean do they really make this transition? Can, are yeah. they getting better at solving problems yeah, in mathematics? Yeah, absolutely, they do. So if you look at one of the three projects that I listed was the Bootstrap project, which is, um, which is aimed at high school students or middle school students, and there the, the approach is specifically tied to the algebra part of mathematics, and so this is where you find exactly what you're looking for. And that's been, that project's been used, usually success, successful, and they have lots of material on how, how it should be taught, so that's great stuff. Okay, we have two more minutes and two questions. So, microphone one, please. Um, hi. hi. How, how do you measure success in your teach? Um, so, mostly at the university level, we look at the final exams. Um, and we have a few papers out that are referenced from the web page there. Um, that's, I mean, of, usually what we do is we have pretty close supervision, even at the university level. So, we look over students' shoulders all the time. Uh, to make sure that, um, that we're, we're teaching them at the appropriate level and the, pre the appropriate pace. But over the years, we've seen measurable um, improvements by looking at the final exams and very specific ones. So we don't just look at the overall grade, we look at individual problems and see how the progress has been and what we expect. Um, and, and there's papers out on that. And microphone four, please. Is there some kind of auto-completion in your editor <laughs> or do you not uh, advise us to use this feature for beginners? <laughs> no, there's not auto-completion auto as far as I know. Um, I'm not sure I would advise against it. I know that uh, my American colleagues, they've, um, I mean, as you've noticed, right, the templates is, is sort of always recurring program elements and you could imagine there being a button that inserts that program fragment. Um, and, and our American friends, they experimented with that um, and they came out not using that in practice anymore. But I can't tell you details on how that is. But if you're interested, you could send me an email and I could find out. Uh, so for some reason, so I can't tell you why, and I'm not, I'm not ideologically opposed to that, but um, we're not doing that. Okay, then, Mike, thank you for that very enlightened talk, and thank give you. him a big applause for that talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>